year began in January, there were a number of predictions about China in 2022. Um, chief and uh, foremost uh, of them would have been the uh, Omicron impact on PRC supply chains. Here you see that Goldman analysts were predicting that um, China might stay shut for all 2022, which it pretty much pretty much did. Um, and then you see the news just, uh, um, you know, trying to help folks wrap, wrap their minds around uh, these enormous uh, reverberating sh supply chain shocks. Um, as China uh, was implementing its zero COVID policy, locking down cities and businesses um, all over the country, including uh, including in its you know manufacturing south, and where its um, global supply chains are centered. So that had some impact on the world economy. But the news that I found the most interesting um, that month was uh, were the reports coming out of China that President Xi was stepping up the stockpiling of essentials. Now I see this as a bit of um, sanction proofing, which I uh, am fully convinced that President Xi has been trying to do for a number of years now. Um, as he watches the Russian experience uh, over Crimea and now in Ukraine. Um, so we had Leaning Wei at the Wall Street Journal who wrote an amazing piece on his accelerated efforts to fortify the Chinese economy against a prolonged period of tension with the U.S. and other country countries by stockpiling essentials and increasing domestic production. She is always talking about food security. Uh, he talks about it so much that, that he makes me nervous about it. Um, you know, totalitarian leaders are always paranoid about one thing or the other. Um, you know, absolute power, uh, as Lord Acton says, corrupts absolutely. But what I think he means by that is that it corrupts your mind as much as... You, as, and possibly your body and your ability to, to understand reality. So, sorry about that. Um, so I don't know, you know, I think he has good right to be concerned. China's always had a, a China has had a, has a history of in, food insecurity, you know, um, a lot of famine in China. Um, some of it man-made during Mao's time, but some of it not, you know. So uh, Chinese leaders for millennia, as you can see I've written here, um, have, uh, have worried about food security. I don't know, what, you know, no one knows what the actual state is, uh, of food security is in China. Um, no one knows really exactly anything <laughs> that happens in China, and that is because of the transparency problem. And uh, I'm not talking about how they are, you know, the Chinese government is not very transparent um, with outsiders, foreigners, or even with its own people. I'm talking about inside the party itself. Um, people are, you know, very nervous about not getting their promotions, um, very nervous about losing their pensions. Um, there's cutthroat competition uh, to rise up in the ranks, and there's very little accountability for lying. So, you know, Beijing has its own problems in trying to measure how, how severe its food issues are. But I thought this was very, very interesting. Um, and I kind of take it. It's a food crisis or preparations for war. That's um, the big question. And I thought that that was um, very interesting. And then of course, by the end of that month, uh, this already takes me back. By the end of January, we already have um, Russia and Ukraine um, standoff. You know, Putin didn't invade until February. 
But by the end of uh, January, I was thinking about the China factor in the stand up, standoff with Russia over Ukraine. And I was wondering what China's role, I think everyone was, it wasn't just me, right? But I was wondering what kind of role China was playing in all that. And uh, we can talk about that later. So in February, um, while the world was, you know, watching and waiting to see what Putin would do, I, I think there was a bit of news, China-related news that um, sort of flew under the, the radar. Um, and I did a story in my newsletter on February the 14th about fallen angel Shimao. Uh, this news um, should have gotten more attention because if you're at all interested in what's happening with the China, the Chinese um, property debt crisis, because uh, everyone knows about Evergrande and uh, the news is, is chock full of stories about, you know, Evergrande, Evergrande's default uh, and, uh, uh, and troubles. But this uh, particular developer, Shimao, um, started to show signs of default as well, uh, problems, and uh, it wasn't classified in the same, you know, group of risky firms um, that Evergrande was. So Nikkei Asia had the story that I liked best about it. There were other reports on Shimao, um, but uh, Shimao really shocked everyone. I'm sure it shocked Beijing as well, because it never looked like a default risk. It is quite big, though not the size of Evergrande, but it's certainly much, uh, it certainly has much higher credit ratings than Evergrande. So investors are, you know, a little bit more conservative. They, they don't like the risk. Those types of investors are going to be more interested in, in a solid firm, not a firm that looks shaky. What happened to Shimao? Um, here Nikkei says that Shimao's bonds looked safe until they didn't. Uh, so I had seen some uh, uh, news about Shimao earlier in back in December, and I um, talked about it in a piece that I wrote on Harris Bricken's China Law Blog. Um, if you uh, if you want to head over there, there's no paywall. You can see uh, what I wrote. I wrote a really lengthy um, article. It's actually in two parts, and you know, apologies for that. But I'm an insolvency attorney. I study debt. Uh, I have studied debt for many years. Um, I've studied recessions. I've studied um, macroeconomic um, structural problems that lead to. Um, you know, financial crises. And of course, I study China. So I, I've studied those things in the US, but I've also been looking at them in China. So this is something that I, <laughs> I'm deeply interested in. And um, uh, it's really the only way that I could, I could best explain what's happening in China. To understand Chinese debt, you've got to understand that it, 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 there's a debt crisis, not simply uh, in in the property um, sector, but it's it's really in most industries. <laughs> um, we're just seeing it in the property sector, and in and if you want to know why that is, you can go and uh, check out the the series that I wrote. But I did cite from my newsletter um, the uh, information um, that uh, Al Jazeera reported back in December, I think, of 2021. And uh, at that time, um, investors were sort of trying to wrap their minds around how this, you know, this is China's 13th largest developer, which is, is still saying something because China, China has enormous developers, right? So it's really, st it's still a very big company. Um, how they didn't see these signs coming. And the reason they didn't see these signs of default coming is well, experts are, are chalking it up to hidden debt. Um, apparently, what happened to sort of tip everyone off that Shimao has a hidden debt problem, problem with 
transparency, clarity of information, and asymmetry of information, uh, is that home buyers in Shanghai for 96 Shimao properties in Shanghai were unable to register to transfer ownership titles because the properties had already been pledged to Shimao's lenders. Now, that's not supposed to happen, right? Um, and for many months, Shimo's onshore bonds were somehow trading at a much more heavily discounted prices than their offshore bonds. Now, off onshore bond markets and offshore bond markets, you know, they can do this, but at the same time, you know, it sort of indicates that there might be information uh, getting to the local investor um, or some sort of sign for them to sell or not buy Shimo, and that same information is not reaching um, offshore investors. So that made, that began to make investors nervous also. Um, I think there were a few other things, but uh, the analyst at Al Jazeera said that the speed of credit down ratings and sharp plunge of more than 50% in Shimao share prices since November kind of also freaked everyone out to, to just see how quickly it all can fall apart. Now, this was, again, this was like a grade A property development firm. It, it had, had passed all of Beijing's three red lines. The three red lines are, are these rules that Xi Jinping's administration came up with to, to deal with too much leverage in the sector. Um, they restrict, they have these, you know, uh, they classify you. If you're in violation of these three red lines, you know, you, you could be in trouble with the government and they won't allow you to, well, this is, <laughs> in theory, they won't allow you access to, uh, you know, state-owned banks will not allow you access to any more money. Uh, and, and I think that that is actually happening in many cases. I say in theory because I'm quite, it's, it's really hard to, to know what China does versus what it says. But I think this is actually happening in, in many cases, um, which is causing, you know, the firms like Evergrande and, and the firms that were already on shaky ground and way over, way over leverage to begin with to start to crumble. But um, it, it, Shima was not one of those. Shima had passed all of Beijing's three red lines, or so we thought. So apparently there was some hidden debt. And if, if there's hidden debt for Shima, one of these, you know, um, highly sought after stable um, property developers, um, then there could equally be hidden debt elsewhere. <laughs> Finally, um, towards the end of the month, we all learn that uh, Russia has indeed invaded Ukraine. Um, and we, you know, if you <laughs> remember what it felt like, the world was just stunned. Um, and so I wrote a little ditty here, <laughs> not a song, but <laughs> a little bit of uh, opinion sort of speculation, but a, I would call it a, 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 a an educated guess, a, a very strong, well-researched and um, strong, strongly informed guess about why I think Xi Jinping and Putin were working towards a Ukrainian invasion for months and probably years. So if this is something that you are interested in reading, I've got it locked. You can let me know. I'll unlock it if, for public access if you don't have a subscription or maybe I'll just send you a link. Because again, this is, you know, this is just what I think. Um, but I have very strong reasons for believing so. And I have uh, pretty darn good and credible sources to, to back those reasons up. So you can take a look at that and see what you think. And then towards the end of March, it became increasingly apparent that Europe was, was beginning to have second thoughts um, of how it related to China. 
most of that had to do with what was happening in Ukraine. Um, there was a fantastic article that came out uh, about that time, um, Financial Times article. It's called Volkswagen and China, the risks of relying on authoritarian states. And you started to notice Germany having the conversation. Then you began to notice Brussels having it as well. So it didn't take too long, right? It didn't take too long for Europe to decide <laughs> that maybe some things had to change. But uh, the decision and uh, actually figuring out how to make those changes are two different things. When you've got, you know, a pandemic that's affecting your own economy at home, uh, it's hard to just rush and kill some of the, you know, the uh, major industry that you have simply because it has business in China when there is no current hot war <laughs> um, in China or with China as there is, you know, near Western Europe in Ukraine. So it's taken a lot of time for Europe to figure out uh, what they want to do. They're still working on it, but this was this was pretty um, pretty substantial when you started to notice. Um, it wasn't too long after Putin invaded Thai, uh, Sorry, after Putin invaded Ukraine, that uh, you know many people in Europe began to rethink um, relationship with China. Now in April we we also saw this unbelievable, at least from <laughs> I think much of the world's standpoint, um, this unbelievably draconian lockdown of Shanghai. This is not unbelievable in the rest of China and I, you know, sometimes I lose patience because uh, we are all quite familiar with Shanghai if we know anything about China, right? Um, and the people of Shanghai are quite familiar with Shanghai and they have these narrow goggles on. Um, they sort of know um, that, that life outside of Shanghai and outside of the other major, you know, more modern and progressive metropolises um, in China, which would be like, I guess, Guangzhou and um, Shenzhen and, uh, yeah, Beijing and these other, you know, major, that is not, actually, it's not very indica uh, in indicative of China. It doesn't, you know, the rest of China lives a great deal differently um, than they do in, in Shanghai. Life has certainly improved for them over the decades. There's no arguing that. But um, they, they don't have the benefit of the same kind of political tolerance um, that comes with living in Shanghai. And, um, you know, a lot of, some people know this, but a lot of people, especially a lot of outsiders, foreigners, do not know it. Um, so Shanghai, the government of Shanghai has always had to tread very carefully um, to, you know, in, in what kinds of levels of transparency it can afford. Um, because it has to satisfy the center, Beijing, the central authority, um, which oftentimes wants to hide negative information. Uh, and yet it knows it has a very, uh, it has a highly educated, you know, foreign expat community and a highly educated uh, local upper middle class Chinese population that can kind of call bullshit and doesn't trust what it says. Sorry for the language. <laughs> So it's a real struggle, you know, and the Shanghai authorities have, I, I don't know, I haven't made this a, 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 a very concentrated study of mine, but I've, it's just my observation that actually I, I think that the Shanghai authorities, the municipal authorities, have, have sort of managed the balance. I know it's been extraordinarily stressful for them, but they sort of managed the balance for, for a long time um, until, uh, until, he, until this. You know, and this is kind of the first time that Shanghai, at least, at least all of the Western journalists in Shanghai and, 
and all, you know, collectively, you know, it's, it's sort of the first time that, that the people living in Shanghai collectively get a sense of what it's like to live in these other Chinese cities that, um, where the authorities don't have the same concerns. They are really a great deal more, you know, oppressive, possibly even more corrupt. I don't know how you want to measure that, but, um, Essentially, they don't worry so much about your hurt feelings <laughs> if they step on your rights. Um, and it was just devastating for folks. I mean, this, this kind of draconian lockdown has been happening, you know, up until this point in so many places throughout China. Um, parents are ripped away from their children. You know, you've, you've all seen the viral images of the, oh, I can't get it out of my head, of the, of the infant that is lifeless in the crate, in the, in, in, in a host, I guess it was a hospital or some sort of quarantine center with what looks like to be a, uh, an infant ward or a hospital type ward and, and the, the parents coming to collect that child and the, the father throwing a chair and this was all kind of put on the, uh, internet and it went viral. Um, there were all these policies, you know, some of the cities thought, I guess, that the ch that children were super spread spreaders and needed to be separated from their parent, from the adult population for that reason. There were, there were rumors of that. Then there were rumors that, well, you know, they just needed to be, I don't know. I, I don't even know. It's hard to fathom, honestly, how people could have even believed some of the things that were happening. But it was happening. Uh, there's accounts of it, right? And it was starting to happen in Shanghai. And I'm reading the news and I'm reading about, you know, uh, Western ex expats rushing to their local embassies for protection. And uh, I know, uh, you know, the foreign services in Shanghai were desperate to try to figure out how to protect their, their citizens uh, abroad under these circumstances. And it, it's not easy. And it, it's at this time or as soon as people could. I mean, it was during this lockdown that I think you saw the... I mean, there was there had been, you know, COVID zero has been going on for, what, two years by this time. And, um, but it was... And, and so there was always a problem with getting people, uh, you know, to move to China for business reasons because they couldn't take, they could take their families, but they weren't, you know, it was, China had locked down. So it was making life, it was making immigration and life quite unpleasant. Um, and so there was sort of already an exodus happening. <laughs> you cannot argue that before this, this accelerated the exodus of, of, of expats, but not only of expats, of Chinese as well. They are um, trying, the Chinese who can, who, who have different values from the authorities in Beijing, and there are plenty, um, are, we're actually trying to leave too, because who could run a business <laughs> with this kind of policy, right? Um, how can you provide for your retirement <laughs> if no one at this point knew how long China was going to have a COVID zero uh, problem and the population had not been vaccinated and so it looked like it could go on forever. Uh, as we found out, it did not, right? So the dramatic, uh, the dramatic turn of events in Shanghai wasn't, of course, the only news happening um, in China. Um, you had the Ukraine war was becoming a serious thorn in President Xi's side, affecting his Belt and Road Initiative. Um, he has a, a rail line that was much celebrated, a freight rail line connecting uh, Germany with China that ran either through Ukraine or nearby Ukraine and the uh, um, that rail service was is being uh, threatened I'm not sure I haven't read the news since then I don't know what's happening with that um, here you see she despite all the moaning and groaning from major businesses, including Chinese businesses, um, he doubles down on COVID zero. Uh, then we still have some simmering animosity 
in Europe, which is uh, said to be imperiling EU-China relations. And in April, it seemed that these global tech firms um, were beginning to admit that they were actually leaving China. They don't say they're leaving China. Of course not. They can't because that puts them at risk, um, puts their operations that are still in China and that they might want to, to keep in China at risk. There's a lot of uh, issues when you want to leave China. Uh, you have to do it rather quick, as quickly as you can <laughs> and quietly. Now, for manufacturers, that's not very quick because it takes a long time, you know, to get a plant up and running somewhere else um, and then to uh, get your machinery going and, and whatnot. Uh, maybe you need to ship machinery over. It depends on what industry you're in. Um, but firms have been leaving China, depending on the industry, depending on where they export to, um, depending on a number of things, uh, long before zero COVID. I think zero COVID might be accelerating that trend, but I did a, I wrote a piece for Arabian Business News, I can send you a link if you're interested, um, that kind of overviews um, the history of firms deciding that China wasn't really working out for them, and that started it really started before Ch Donald Trump's trade war when wages um, began to rise and, you know, a number of the foreign firms began to lose tax subsidies um, because what were the tax subsidies there for? Um, my cynical view <laughs> is that China needed to develop its domestic industries. You know, you're talking about going from a essentially non-developed country to a more developed country in a matter of a few years. You don't have industry built up. You don't have the know-how. You don't have the infrastructure. You don't have any of it. And you need the foreign industries to come, come in and show you how it's done. And, and obviously there's a lot of Voluntary, volunt voluntary tech transfer and involuntary tech, tech transfer that goes along with that. But to attract all that business, um, to attract that know-how, you're going to give your foreign firms, that's why foreign firms were rushing to go to China. They were getting all these breaks that they couldn't get in their home country. They were getting all sorts of Chinese government subsidies, right? Um, once... China builds out its own industry in whatever industry that is, um, then it has less need for foreign firms. And so it starts to drop off those tax subsidies or whatever subsidies they're giving. It may not be in tax. It could be something else like, you know, discounts on property or I don't know, help with marketing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It, it, there's a wide range of support that, that it's not orchestrated through Beijing. Beijing just sets the standards. It's all orchestrated through the local governments who are competing themselves for handouts from Beijing in terms of the budget. You know, they want a bigger portion of the budget because they are more successful at attracting um, foreign industry and they need it is it would be the argument so so they get very creative they've gotten very creative of ha at how they were supporting foreign uh, industry uh, foreign businesses coming in but that began to um, that began to stop and as that stopped over time they also noticed that wages were rising because the living standard in china had been rising and all of this was taking place long before covid it, it started before trump's trade war but trump's trade war also accelerated um or escalated i'm sorry the 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 worst you know uh the downside i suppose <laughs> escalate the downside um it made it made um producing in China uh, much less profitable. So lots of firms had been leaving before then, but here we start to see global tech firms actually admitting to it, um, which was unusual. And they don't call it, you know, leaving. They say they're decentralizing, which means they may still leave some of their operations in China for now. Maybe they don't, you know. I think you're familiar with what's happening with Apple. Um, 
I have that in my news as we get closer to you know the current time. Um, but uh, this is when it we start noticing, or at least I started noticing that they were publicly admitting that they were actually heading out of China. And that, that was interesting. Um, that same week, you see here in my headline for the week of April 25th, uh, the U.S. had warned the Solomon Islands about the agreement it had signed with China to establish military and police policing operations. Um, on the islands. And um, this was a real shock to everyone, especially um, especially Australia, especially New Zealand and the US. It caused a flurry of last minute diplomatic activity um, to try to prevent this agreement. And then when the agreement was actually signed, the US, the US released a statement uh, saying that Washington would have significant concerns and respond accordingly to any steps to establish permanent Chinese military presence in the Pacific Island nation. Specifically, they said any steps to establish a de facto, so it doesn't matter what you call it, whether you just call it a policing agreement or not, if it looks to be like a de facto permanent military presence or something that has um, military power projection capabilities or military installation, then the U.S. would have to respond to that. Um, the reason that the Solomon Islands and China have been cozying up to each other it really has to do with the, the leadership. Um, the Solomons, a former leader uh, in the Solomons, was actually a little bit more pro-Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan had relations, had diplomatic relations with the Solomon Islands up until about 2019. Uh, and then the leader, I'm trying to remember what his name is, can't remember, sorry. Uh, the leader was ousted, um, or I should say was voted out, but they're not sure that the vote was, was legitimate or not. So he was voted out and the new leader um, was much, much more China friendly. Um, and back in November of 2021, at the end of November, there were a series of riots, and actually those riots killed four people. I think I think it could have, there could have been some Chinese among the injured, um, but Solomon Islands has a you know like a, a, a China I don't know if you want to call it a Chinatown, but it's a China district with you know shops and and whatnot. Um, the attacks were against that section of town on the main island, uh, if I understand correctly, of where the capital sits. Um, so it says the violence began after protesters from a group called Malash, Malata, Malata for Democracy traveled to the capital, which is on the area, uh, and, and gathered outside the parliament. They were angry um, over what they believed to be um, a stolen election and uh, unhappy with the current China policy. And witnesses said that rioting erupted after, after the minister, the pro-China friendly minister, minister refused to, to meet them. And it says much of, uh, of the capital's Chinatown area was destroyed. Um, and as a result, Police and peacekeeping uh, operations were dispatched from several nations to support the capital in, you know, maintaining stability. But of course, China stepped in um, under the pretext, if you will, of protecting Chinese citizens. And that's about the time when I guess China was able to. Um, use its influence on the island to, to get a, an agreement um, with the Solomons. So we are all watching this very closely. Now the, the, the current prime minister who is who I've said to, is China friendly, he's trying to downplay this agreement. He says there is no intention to allow um, a permanent military presence uh, of a foreign nation on his on, on 
you know, on the islands. But um, everyone's sort of watching to see if if um, if if that is indeed the case. Fascinating stuff.